All right, sounds a bit different because I am traveling, but we are going to get through the memoir, or the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. <laughs> so let's start with episode two, Memoirs of a Cloudy Cuckoo Girl. It was a ghastly tale of a winter's night. One of an invisible killer and a crime perpetrated on the pavement along Briar Road. As the victim lay at death's door, the mystery of just who had stabbed the young lady from behind had been resolved. But no sooner had my friend saved that Eastern Exchange student from his harrowing plight than in the dim, flickering shadows of gaslight did a second bizarre crime rend the stillness of that very night. I dare say most can still recall the sensational headlines of the day. Haunted apartment of death. The condemned criminal's curse. The dread demon of coal gas. Yet, though the great detective had at once discerned the truth upon his arrival at the scene, It only proved to be the overture that announced the rising of the curtain on a most tragic play. Hey, Rebecca Ryunosuke. <laughs> my name is Ryunosuke Narahodo. I'm a fledgling lawyer just starting out my journey. Six months ago, I arrived as a visiting student of law. Having made the long voyage across the sea from the Empire of Japan to here, London, England. And on the way, in quite extraordinary circumstances, I made the acquaintance of the world-famous detective. Mahal. Currently, I reside in the attic of the detective's own lodgings, from where I run my legal consul consultancy of sorts. I've successfully defended a number of clients in Britain's highest court, the Old Bailey. But since a particularly grueling and unforgettable legal battle four months ago now, I haven't returned to the courtroom. In truth, I lost my right to return. But that epic trial was just one small part of an epic tale. A tale was... a tale which was now about to awaken from slumber. Thanks to a letter that arrived this morning from my homeland. You hungry? <laughs> Mmm, what a delicious smell wafting up the stairs. It must nearly be time for breakfast. I better go down to Mr. Sholm's suite and say good morning to the great detective and his flatmate. I wanna see my fruit boy. Here he comes. <laughs> I missed you, Herlock. I missed you so much. I love you. And you too, Iris. You're adorable. Ah, oh, Runo, good. I was just about to call up to you. The bacon's ready. Well, good morning, Iris. It's most delicious as usual. Before we eat, though, I have some news. I have surprises my- Hi. <laughs> Shh, not another word, Naruhodo. Looks so good. This could just be the obtuse thing for my pre-breakfast stagnation repelling mental stimulation, my dear fellow. Well, morning to you, Mr. Sholmes. Ah, yes. I see. Oh, hi. <laughs> hi. <laughs> so that's it. The truth is as clear to me as day. My faculties of observation have revealed it again. Um, what are you talking about? You, Mr. Narhoto. You have this very morning met with a surprise. Well, is that not the case? Well, um, really, my dear fellow. It barely warrants explanation. Firstly, your hair is particularly unkempt, somewhat reminiscent of a bird's nest. Secondly, you have neglected to fasten the third button on your jacket. Clearly, when considered together, these two facts point to you having been flustered this morning. Um, can I talk now? But of course, of course, though, I don't look for admiration, you understand. My hair always looks like this. It's been this way since I first met you. Oh, it has. On the button, 
You ripped it off. Uh, oh. Wait, what? <laughs> I mean, good for y'all. <laughs> the button was ripped off last night, if you remember. By you. Oh, oh? <gasps> Harley pulled your button off. Yeah, what? <laughs> Ah, yes, I recall the incident now. It was after supper, was it not? As the evening advanced, I picked up my violin and began to play the wailing notes of a haunting tune. But then, to my utter dismay, the third string snapped. Why did it have to happen? Why? Little wonder then that in my vexation, I grabbed the first button I saw and ripped it from its proper place. Oh. <laughs> Well, I'd like it back now, please. It's troubling me that I can't fasten my jacket. And it's troubling me that you expect me to know where it is. Somewhere thereabouts on the floor, one presumes. Helpful. What matters at the present time, my dear fellow, is simply whether or not my deduction was an erring. But Hurley, Aruno said it when he came in, didn't he? I had a surprise this morning. Well, that really is a surprise. Well, yeah, this man is the pride of the British Empire, the famous consulting detective, Mr. Herlock Sholmes. Well, there can't be a single person in the world who doesn't know his name. All right, then. Enough of this silly conversation. Come and eat this bacon before it goes cold. And I have a new herbal tea for you to try, too. My latest special blend! And here we have Iris Wilson, Mr. Sholmes' lodger and companion. A truly exceptional young girl, who's the author of a highly successful serialization here in London. Yep, The Adventures of Herlock Sholmes, as published in Rance Magazine. So, Mr. Rohoto, won't you put us out of our misery? What surprised you this fine morning? Oh, well, I received a letter from Japan. Oh, from Susie, you mean? Was it really? Well, that's right. She had some rather startling news, in fact. Ah, intriguing indeed. You must tell us all about it over breakfast. Oh, yes, what fun! Well, yeah, let's, let's learn all about it. Well, this is the letter that arrived from Japan this morning by International Post. Oh, how lovely. Look at Susie's beautiful writing. I wish I could read it. And how is your traditional assistant faring, may I ask? Well, she's very well, thank you. In fact, according to what she's written, she actually appeared as a lawyer at the Japanese Supreme Court and won a case. <gasps> really? Oh, isn't she wonderful? Cut above your good self, my dear fellow. Hey, I've won cases too, you know. Well, apparently, Mr. Natsume appeared in the trial as a witness. Natsume, Natsume. No, I don't recall that name. Of course you do. We helped that man like twice. You know when those two, ca you know when those two cases that took place on Briar Road six months ago? Ah. The mustache twitchy man with the somewhat feline eyes and the mustache. He didn't have two mustaches, Hurley. Yes, who could forget those two cases? They made a very deep impression on me. Just the cases, not the people. Although I must confess, the details are a little hazy now. Yeah, a very deep impression they made on you, clearly. So, what was this startling news penned by Mrs. Otto? Do you remember the case of the haunted lodgings, Mr. Sholmes? Ah, yes. It's very interesting, you know. I don't feel entirely uncertain that the case of that nature did not not occur. He's totally forgotten, then. Well, anyway, in her letter, Mrs. Otto asked that we read over her case notes again and investigate further. Though it took place half a year ago? For what purpose? Because of something that Mr. Natsume said to her, apparently. 
He suggested that the real reason why she was called back to Japan so suddenly might have something to do with the case of the haunted lodgings. Oh? On Mr. Natsumi's return to Japan, Mrs. Izato's father questioned him about the case, she says. And something Mr. Natsumi said appeared to trouble Professor Mikotoba, prompting him to, to send that telegram. Oh! That case, yes! It was... very strange, wasn't it? Yeah. And I had compiled the whole story into a nice, neat manuscript, ready for publication, too. But then Hurley here was all funny about it, remember? It was very mean. That story must not be published, you said. Very mysteriously as well. Really? I said that. Are you sure? Hmm. Do you perhaps know something about it as well, Mr. Schultz? About why Mrs. Opta was suddenly told four months ago? <laughs> Sorry, I see the word four mouths and I'm like, no, no, it's not four mouths ago. Well, maybe it is, who knows? But she had a return to Japan? It's been four months now since we waved Susie off at Dover. It was such a shock, wasn't it? The way she just suddenly announced that she had to go back to Japan? Indeed it was. Due to a telegram she received from her homeland, I believe. Yeah, that's right. Telling her to return urgently. Yes, because her father had passed away. No, 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 no! It just said he was suffering from a high fever. The cause of which was unknown. He's, he's not dead. But according to this letter, that news about her father's fever was just a ruse. <gasps> a ruse! So Susie's daddy lied to her, so that she'd make the voyage back home? We haven't told Iris about her dad yet either, have we? Why would he do that? Well, I have to admit, I have absolutely no idea. But she believes it's almost certainly related to the case of the haunted lodgings. Summoning her back to Japan so suddenly like that? I wonder what Mrs. Otto's father's hiding. Hmm, Hurley. Do you know what it's all about? <laughs> he got dressed already. <laughs> He's like, no, bye. Hmm, <laughs> ah, well, who can say? What? But, but you said... Please, I have engagements, my dear fellow. My calendar is quite surprisingly full today. And a stringent analysis of the matter would be excessive, I feel. Even if I were quite at leisure. So, man the forge of my absence, won't you, Iris? I will, Hurley, don't worry. See you later. Bye, love you. He spilled it off rather quickly there. I think perhaps Professor Mikotoba isn't the only person hiding something here. So Seki san was involved in two cases, but only one of them was forbidden from being published. By of all people, Mr. Sholmes. I refuse to believe he's a bad guy. There's no way. He's hiding like an undercover double agent investigation where he's investigating, um, it's gotta be that guy with the birds, right? He was, he, I forgot what his name was. <laughs> Sorry, it was like forever ago. Like, we had to meet him in uh, this one room, and he like spread his arms out, and like doves came flying out. And he was like really hyped, they're important, and we never saw him again. Like, he's sus. He's so sus. He tippity tops us. <laughs> <laughs> I found them at last. Iris, are, are they. The notes about the case, that's right. Susie and I compiled them together. The case of the haunted lodgings. Do you want to read them, Runa? Sure. I mean, absolutely. Thank you, Iris. I have no idea what secrets could still be hiding in the shadows of this case. But perhaps if I read them over the notes again, something might come to light. That's the spirit. Oh, I guess we're in the case. And so, Iris and I decided to read over the case notes again together. Everything from what happened to our investigation and that fierce battle in court that followed. 
reliving every detail. I just need to find a clue. And I have all the time in the world. Because of course, I'm no longer allowed to practice law in the courts of Great Britain. Is this, where, is this something new from this case four months ago? Yeah, it has to be. Yeah, because this is, right? No, I don't know. I'm really confused all of a sudden. <laughs> it was six months ago. A mysterious incident that unfolded on the wintry streets of London. A young woman was found lying in the snowy pavement of Briar Road with a knife in her back. Unfortunately for her, her life is spared, but she was unconscious for several days following the incident. The fog was thick, and nobody saw her attack her, but by a cruel twist, twist of fate, a visiting Japanese student was walking behind her at the time and was duly arrested. That man was Soseki-san, and the man who effected his arrest was Mr. Sholmes. Oh, look at us. Believing in our compatriot's innocence, Suzato-san and I decided to represent Soseki-san in court. And after a grueling trial of many twists and turns, we finally managed to prove his innocence. Joyful, joyous, jubilant jubilation! Was the man's reaction after the trial, but his jubilant jubilation was short-lived. We received a telegram from Mr. Sholmes the following morning. The victim of the briar road stabbing has regained consciousness. We can meet her. Hurry to Bart's at once. Hurry to Bart's at once. So Susanta said and I summoned a hansom and headed straight to the hospital. shouldn't be in the hospital though. Hi. There you are at last. Well good morning Mr. Sholmes. I think not. Oh! You're late. What on earth took you so long? Your telegram only arrived at five o'clock Mr. Sholmes and it's, 20, and a, it's a 20 minute ride to the hospital. Well yeah that's right it's half past five now. I think we made really good time, actually. The time is utterly ir irrelevant. The fact is, I have been waiting for what feels like an eternity. <laughs> In point of fact, I myself was awoken at four this morning by a telegram boy. And feeling it was somewhat unjust that I alone had been roused at such an hour, I sent one to you. Oh, well, thanks for that. Anyway, you're here now, so the victim is over there. She only just regained consciousness. <laughs> Watch your first be Soseki did it! We're like, wait, no, we didn't! <laughs> you should introduce yourselves. I shall observe from here. So that's the lady who was found in the snow-covered pavement with a knife in her back. Her name is, ah yes, here we are, Miss Green. Okay, hi, Miss Green. Oh, first of all, hold on. I want, I want to see the little rat friend. Eek, a mouse! Mr. Naruhoto, an enormous mouse! Hmm, vermin in a hospital? That doesn't seem like the best. But it looks like a very healthy specimen, doesn't it? It's very plump. The rats here are very well fed. I'm not sure we can say it's down to the excellence of this facility, if that's what you were thinking. What's up? Hello? <laughs> I was like, this looks- it's bright green. This is standing out as, click me, click me. <laughs> oh look, there's a photograph in this frame here. Oh, yes, it's a picture of a young gentleman. Oh, well, he looks like about the same age as Miss Green, I would say. Perhaps a young woman's special someone, do you think? My mind is an Arahoda. I didn't know you had a sense for matters of the heart. Well, not the least. I sincerely said the first thing I thought of. Okay, we'll talk to you. How's it going? <laughs> um, good morning. Oh, 
Oh, she's an artist! I don't know if we knew that already. Um, hello. I'm Rinosuke Naruhoto from the Empire of Japan. Oh no! No! <clears throat> That's a voice for her. Oh no! Oh, was it your knife that? Are you the man who? No, no, no! I'm a lawyer. And I'm Suzata Mikotaba. Pleased to meet you. Oh no! Was it? Was it your knife then? Are you the one? Ma'am, stop it! <laughs> no, no, I assure you. I'm Mr. Naruhoto's judicial assistant. We heard that you regained consciousness and wanted to come give you our best wishes. Best wishes? For me? Um, thank you. I'm Olive. Olive green, like my coat. I'm an artist. Well, no, that's not right, is it? What I mean is, I'm trying to be an artist. Well, what I really mean is, I desperately want to be an artist. But the truth is, I don't have any talent. I know I don't. Well, that's the thing about being an artist. You can gather some skill. <laughs> it's no wonder I was stabbed in the back. Well, I don't think it's related, actually. Gosh, this young woman seems to bend over backwards to put herself down. Seeing as we're here, we should ask her what would happen from her perspective, I suppose. So what happened? To suddenly be struck in the back by a blade as you were walking along the pavement. What a terrible experience you had, Miss Green. Dot dot dot. It was so cold that day, and the fog was so thick, I couldn't see a thing. That was four days ago now, I think. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I'm afraid you've been comatose all that time. But the case has been solved, hasn't it? While well, I've been here in the hospital, I mean. Indeed it has, my dear madam. Spectacularly by none other than I, Herlock Sholmes. Mr. Sholmes, as you all know, it was Mr. Naruhoto's hard-working court that solved the case. Are you yet to hear what happened, Miss Green? Yes, I'm afraid so. A gentleman from the police force is supposed to be coming to fill me in shortly. Oh, I see. Me coming around seems to have made everyone frantically busy. I'm so sorry. I should have never regained consciousness. It was so selfish of me. No, no. Oh, no! We're also relieved that you're on the mend, Miss Green. Really, we are. Well, that kind of attitude. Maybe her surname should be Blue, not Green. But I'm just... <laughs> Alright, let's learn about you. So, you're an artist, are you, Miss Green? Oh no. I couldn't possibly claim that. I'm a fledgling artist at best. I mean, I'm a student of art, really. At the Thorndike Academy of Fine Arts. Oh my! An Academy of Fine Arts! Great Britain is such a wonderful country! Tell me, Miss Green, do you live hereabouts? Oh no, actually. I don't deserve it. But I have a little flat on Brixton Road. I see. How very interesting. Oh no, is it? Brixton is some ten stops away on the underground from here. And Thornack Academy is a mere three-minute walk from Brixton Town Center. Well, does that matter, Mr. Schultz? Perhaps not. But Briar Road is a far less celebrous part of town by comparison, dwelt in by those of inferior means. Including the Maleficent Mr. Mustache. Inferior means? I mean, I suppose the Seki-san does fit that bill. It struck me as somewhat out of the ordinary for a young fine art student to be walking around in such a district. That's all. What you hiding, Olive? Huh? What's this? You suddenly clammed up. Mr. Sholmes, you should be ashamed of yourself, prying into a young maiden's private affairs. <laughs> oh, dear me, do forgive me. Um, if you don't mind, I'm being discharged shortly. So I need to pack up my things. 
Well, yeah, of course. We won't keep you. Thank you so much, Miss Green. Oh, hi, hi. Is there a Mr. Narrow Fodder here? Mr. Narrow Fodder. Narrow Fodder? Well, um, if you're looking for Naruhoto, the lawyer, that's me, but... Ah, Mr. Narrow Fodder. Good, good, good. This is for you. It's a message from Mr. Saucy Nuts... Nuts? Mr. Saucy Nuts Meg. Oh. <laughs> oh, Mr. Nuts Meg sent a message for me? But why would a policeman be delivering a message from Mr. Natsume? Exactly. What exactly is going on here? What's a Scotland Yard constable doing playing delivery boy at this time of the morning? Oh, what are you waiting for? Let me see that. Oh. Da, 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 da. Well, this is most unexpected. Well, something wrong, Mr. Sholmes? Is something wrong, Mr. Sholmes, he says. Have you not seen this note that I grabbed from your hand before you read? No, how could I have? It would seem that London's criminals have no intention of letting the great detective rest. A new case calls. A case of murder, no less. We must depart at once. <gasps> murder? Murder? Call the cab. Time is of the essence. But the trouble is... We've yet to read Mr. Natsumi's note. I was thinking we ought to pay him a visit in his lodgings once we did. That would be entirely convenient. Convenient? What do you mean? It's all here in the note, my dear fellows. The murder we must investigate took place at Mr. Mustache's lodgings. What? A whole fiacre at once. Why, do I, can't, why can't I pronounce any of these vehicle names? <laughs> it was only yesterday that Saseki-san was in court, and we were dispelling doubts about his innocence. And now the very next day, there's a murder at the man's own address? He may very well be the unluckiest man alive. Or so it seemed to us at the time, but we were soon to discover something because I accidentally clicked. What were we discover? Uh-uh. Something, I guess. We found a body. We found a body. <laughs> what on earth? Oh my. The gentleman is deceased without question. He's dead. Oh, welcome student, Mr. Naruto Esquire. Mr. Natsume. Oh, why? Oh, why is this happening? Why to me? I've only just got out of court yesterday. I was finally home after two days of misery. Well, I mean, don't you have, like, an alibi being, like, you know, the Supreme Court? <laughs> That's a very good alibi, I feel. <laughs> and then I wake up the next day to this! No early bird should catch a worm like this! Wolf a worm without wiggle! I see you're in high spirits again this, mor this morning, Mr. Mustache. Ooh, not the horrible Erlock Sholmes! Shoo! Shove off! Show yourself the door! I never invited you! Mr. Sholmes came here with us. I'm quite sure he'll be able to help you, Mr. Natsume. I am entirely at your disposal, Mr. Mustache. What can I do for you? Hey! Mr. Makes me want potatoes real bad, sir. <laughs> Here they are already, the busybodies. Ah, Inspector Gregson, what a pleasant surprise. Pleasant, is it? it? Gives me heartburn every time I see your face at a crime scene, Sholmes. Huh, I deduce, Inspector, that your heartburn is a result of your excessive consumption of fried food. Um, good morning, Inspector. This is a crime scene. Don't you go touching anything. Good morning to you too, Sunshine. Uh, I don't want to look at the body, but I feel like he's not gonna let me. Oh, oops. Click through nothing. What a terrible thing to have happened. 
It's only been three days since I was arrested for the incident on the pavement outside. And then, having finally regained my freedom, it starts happening all over again. Endless existence of excruciating experiences. So the victim lived here on the ground floor. And your room is just one story up, isn't it? Yes, that's right. In a way, we were neighbors, I suppose. So did you know the victim? Were you friends? <laughs> yes. <laughs> What's the matter with Sasaki-san now? It was an innocent of question, wasn't it? Why does he seem so shaken by it? I suppose he, he wasn't a complete stra stranger. But, 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 did he ever invite me to his room? Never! So, yes? All the time? <laughs> In, on my honor, I swear, don't do that! I'm your lawyer! What an extreme reaction. You're probably wishing you'd never asked now, aren't you, Mr. Arahoto? When, I, when we found him here, I felt wretched. Which is why I sent word asking you to come. Through that inspector over there! Okay, let's talk to that inspector over there! <laughs> so, inspector, what was the victim's name? Who was he? Mr. William Sh Not Shakespeare. Mr. William Shamspear. He was a lodger here. As you can probably tell, he was an actor. A bit of a dead loss as it happens, or just dead. Mr. Shamspear. It was the landlord, old Mr. Garadeb, and the other lodger, Mr. Natsume, who found him. The fellow didn't rise at his usual hour, so Garadeb got worried and kicked the door down. Did he? Okay. But, yeah, I was like, but doesn't Mr. Garadeb have a bad leg? Ah, yeah, right you, you're right there. It was that jittery Japanese hunchback over there who did actually did. Oh no, don't call him that. That's me. Don't, don't call him names. Oh, really? So Zaki said? The victim was pretty hard up, it seems. He even done some time inside for petty crimes. He had no money, no place to go, no friends. His only acquaintances were the people in this house. A miserable life and a miserable end to it. So, so what exactly is Mr. Natsume still doing here? He's not involved in the investigation, so... Shouldn't you have sent him away from the crime scene? Well, I'm not saying it's because that fellow looks odd or anything, or that he acts suspicious. But I thought it'd be prudent to take a statement from the culprit- I mean, cohabitor. He thinks he did it. You nearly said culprit there, didn't you? Oh dear. Mr. Natsume appears to be under suspicion again. Well, yeah, it certainly seems that way. He does just come across as an odd fellow, doesn't he? Poor man. How unfortunate. Anyway, I can't say much until the coroner gets here. But I don't think the fellow's been a goner that long. The body's still warm. Even if the inspector would allow it, I don't think I could bring myself such a dead body. I mean, can we poke at it? <laughs> I like. Darling. What you doing? What you doing, honey? <laughs> um, Mr. Sholmes, what are you doing? Ha! Huh. You need only observe to know it, my dear fellow. Investigating, naturally. Well, there's nothing natural about that pose, sir. <laughs> Mr. Sholmes, have you made some reckless discovery? Patience, my dear madam, patience. We've not been here in this room five minutes. So far, all I've managed to, all I've managed to deduce is what actually happened. <gasps> My goodness! But isn't that everything we need to know, Mr. Scholz? Hmm. Now that you propose the idea, I believe one could indeed see it that way. At the present time, I have managed to draw two incontrovertible conclusions. The first, that there was a physical struggle here last night in which the victim fought for his life. He says, as this man has clearly, apparently been drinking something out of a cup and dry died. <laughs> <laughs> or eating with a fork. 
Sorry, I saw the cup. <laughs> Mr. Natsume. Mr. Natsume, what's wrong? Is something that Mr. Sholm said significant somehow? N no Don't mind me. Forget I was here. And my second conclusion is that there was a poison lingering in the air here last night that passed the victim's lips. Nonsense! <laughs> he said innocently. <laughs> All right, Mr. Osme, why are you reacting so extremely to Mr. Sholm's seductions? No, please, pretend I'm not here. The miserable, ineffable, inscrutable, insignificant. Impossible to ignore. You must tell us everything, Mr. Sholm. Spare no detail. Da, 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 da. But of course. Let the theatrical tragedy before us be unraveled by my great deductions. Presented for your pleasure in two acts. We've heard some truly outstanding great deductions from Mr. Sholm's look. <gasps> it's my favorite mini game! <laughs> no doubt this will be no exception. What miracles will unfold before our eyes this time? So, my dear fellows, for your delight and wonder, let the curtain rise. For Erlock Sholm's Logic and Reasoning Spectacular, Act 1. Alright, we'll do this, we'll do the deductions, and then we will call the episode. <laughs> Alright, topic one, cause of death. So you're laying that cup and... Wait, hold on, was there something underneath his shirt? No, that's the badge he had. Sorry. Careful, obser careful observation of the victim. Reveal some of the events that transpired in this disconsol... Disconsolate room, disconsolate room last night. <laughs> Oh wait, he has rabies. What is this? Foam of the mouth, the disease clearly indicates the use of poison. From butter. Next to the victim, we know a big slice of butter. <laughs> Why is he not? Why is he just eating butter from a plate? That's so weird. Next to the victim, we notice a large dining plate which contains, you'll observe, <gasps> or soap. <laughs> is that? Is that weirder? <laughs> One half of a sizable bar of soap. Meaningfully, indubitably. Why is the soap set on so purposely on this dish? Like the victim's last supper, in fact. Yes. Could it be that the man was about to eat it? Of course. The fork reveals the answer. Hmm. Well, was, oh yeah, probably it's, it's rigor mortis that why his hand is grasping the fork still. <laughs> It appears that the young man's appetite was his undoing. Taking up arms in the form of his cutlery, the victim engaged in a deadly battle for his life. Yet the struggle against his hunger was in vain, for in the end, he couldn't resist devouring the slippery feast. But London's foul soap was besmirched by foul poison. Yes, the victim's life was claimed by poison that tainted the contents of the plates. Yeah, no, there, there's clearly a tea spit stain, or a coffee stain, depending on what he was drinking. Like right there. Oh, it's a teacup, so tea, probably. The soup and the lather about the young- oh, but why is his mouth foamy? Anyway. The soup and the lather about the young man's mouth are too perfectly matched to ignore. The cause of death was clearly intoxication due to excessive ingestion of foul soap. Though personally, I have a greater interest in the taste of the foul candle wax, of course. Conclusion! Poisoning from soap in in ingestion. Topic 2. Blip blip or murder. The cause of death identified, we proceed to have two, where we ponder the next question. Was this blip blip or murder? The audience will recall that death occurred during the victim's last supper. Did the man dine and dine and die alone? The single teacup suggests the answer. To draw a conclusion that such meager evidence would be foolish, however, certainly. The careful criminal could have absconded with his own cup to, to cover his tracks. Well, allow me to lift the veil of doubt, my dear fellow. <laughs> Indeed. What reveals the answer, of course, is the broken lock. The force open now. By the time of the incident, this door was locked. And the sole key was in the victim's pocket. 
In other words, when the victim consumed the poison, he must have been alone. Alone with his inferior soap, from whence wafted an inferior scent. And with that acrid aroma lingering in the air, the victim met his end in tragic solitude. He could take comfort only in the fact that his soul was well cleansed on the way to the hereafter. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no possible perpetrator present. I like that we're, we're going to have to make it seem, put out evidence that it's our client who is there. This concludes the final act of Erlok Shulam's Great Deduction. It's like, my man's way too nervous, not my man, but the man is way too nervous to be like, nah, wasn't here. Well, there's just one thing, Mr. Sholmes. You are disposed to identifying just one thing, aren't you, Mr. Arhoto? Pray, what concerns you? Well, no matter how hungry he was, do you really think the man would have eaten soap? It's quite apparent that this man had barely a penny to his name. It is a curious thing, but to one so destitute, soap can suddenly appear quite irresistibly appetizing. Well, how extraordinary! In truth, I have tried a little soap myself in the past. You've eaten it, you mean? My dear fellow, it was some time ago now. Don't judge. My postulation was that it would cleanse my gut. And did it? As I writhed in agony on the floor and spilled the contents of my stomach, yes, I believe it did. The experience taught me a valuable lesson. Soap is quite poisonous. <laughs> It has an unpleasant taste and leads to great discomfort. In summary, I cannot recommend it. I don't recommend it either. <laughs> Please don't eat soap. Well, believe me, I wouldn't eat it even if you did. There's something that troubles me as well, actually. Oh? Oh, what's that? It's Mr. Natsumi. <clears throat> I couldn't help noticing him shuddering and quivering out of the corner of my eye. Almost as if Mr. Sholm's seduction is such a nerve somehow. N nonsense Well, that clenched teeth episode didn't last. I think, judging by Mr. Natsumi's reaction, the great detective's seductions may need some gentle corrections in order to reach the actual truth. Yeah, Mr. Sholm's observations and deductions are sometimes a little too sharp. He has a tendency to hit the nail on the side of the head and drive it to and drive it in at an obtuse angle. When he does that, it it falls to us to straighten things out. All right, then let's see what we can do. Yes, we must pick up the keywords in Mr. Shum's quite brilliant deductions and discreetly exchange them for something that makes a little more sense. If we do that, I'm sure we'll arrive at what Mr. Shum's meant to say in the first place. In that case, are you ready for the second performance of the day? Once again, my dear fellows, for your continued delight and wonder, let the curtain rise. For Herlock Shulam's Logic and Reasoning Spectacular, Act 1. Course correction! Hold it, Mr. Shulams! Alright, so not soap ingestion. I'm pretty sure this part I just skipped through until, I, until it stops it myself. Or it stops it itself, right? So I don't see it really go back either. Yeah, okay, cool, 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 cool. Well, well, you can't deny that a fork implies a man was eating something or about to eat something. Yes, that's true. Ooh. If I was, if I were to decide to eat some soap, I should prefer to use a fork than attempt it with chopsticks. <laughs> well, and of course, only half a bar of the soap is left on the plate. But might not there be some other explanation? Something material that proves whether or not the man really ate some soap. Let's check his mouth, sir. Sir, your your mouth. Oh wait, no, no, no. I see it. Hold on. Right there. Look, there's more soap on the floor here. Mr. Shamster must have really loved this stuff. Let's not jump to conclusions, Mr. Narahodo. Look closely at the soap. Do you see that it would fit together perfectly with a half bar on the table? Oh, what the- how can that be? I think that 
they're two halves of the same bar that broke apart. So we didn't- wait, did I not- Oh, present, present, right? Nah, present. Take that! And the little mouse again! <laughs> could it be- could, well, could it be that the man was about to eat it? Of course, the other piece of soap reveals the answer. It being the other half of the soap on the table. In short, the victim was not eating soap at all. That'd be silly. But it's obvious, really. For no, for no depths of hunger could drive any man to attempt to eat soap. Even I, with my unquenchable thirst for practical knowledge, took only a single bite. Well, that begs the question of how a man was poisoned. Because there's no sign of food on the table. An excellent observation, Mr. Narohodo. And one that furnishes us with the answer we seek. For London's foul soap is besmirched by foul poison. Okay, now we go ahead. And... Okay, yeah. So it's a cup, it's a cup. Mr. Sholmes is still pushing the soap argument then. Perhaps he's suggesting the man lick the soap rather than eat it. If soap in London is that poisonous, I don't think I want to be washing my hands with it. There are no signs of any food in this room at all. Okay, find food. Got it. <laughs> of course. Food isn't the only thing that passes through people's lips, is it? Cup. 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 Yeah. A western vessel for serving infusions of dried tea leaves. It's a teacup, Mr. Narahodo, as you well know. Stop putting on airs. And it's empty. Ah, oh, so we reestablished that the victim wasn't eating soap when he died. However... There's significant evidence suggests he was drinking tea. My thoughts exactly. So, tea, yes? Drink that! You know what? I feel weird that we're not looking at his face. <laughs> like, what's up? <laughs> yeah, the victim's life was claimed by poison that tainted the teacup. And indeed, cups have been the vessel of choice for practicing poisoners over the centuries. It would appear that this victim drank every last drop. Well, there's no sign of food anywhere in the room. Which leads us to a mutable conclusion. The cause of death was clearly intoxication due to the ingestion of poison contained in the teacup. Yee! Yeah, we did it! Poison in the tea! Solved. I want, like, not like a gritty version. Like a this amount of pretty version of like clues clues. Should <laughs> be fun. <laughs> Alright, next question. Was it blah 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 or murder? Sasaki san? Sasaki san, was it blah blah blah? Were you there when it was blah blah blah? <laughs> ah, the Western vessel for infused hot drinks again. It's already heavy it's already featured heavily in our deduction so far. Yes. We can imagine that shortly before his death, Mr. Shamsu was having a drink of tea. There'd be nothing remarkable about that, but what troubles me is Mr. Natsume's reaction when he heard Mr. Shulm suggest it. There's more to the seduction than it seems. We must closely examine the scene of the crime again for some more clues. Nope, I see it. I see it. I see it. But also, oh, that's nothing important of it. You can see his face. Okay. I was wondering what they were hiding it from us. But anyway. Cup 2. Bruiser. Take that! Does a man dine and dine alone? This other teacup suggests the answer. Yeah, there are two teacups that have seen in the room all along. Ah! In other words, this is a strong indication that the victims last supper there was a guest present. At the very least, we can now say with certainty that somebody else was here in this room last night, taking tea with the victim. What are you talking about? Utterly unbelievable, unjustly unreasonable. Draw a conclusion on such meager evidence would be foolish, however. Alright, well, how can we guess this person at the table? Allow me to lift the veil of doubt, my dear fellow. Do you mean to say 
You know who exactly was in this room at the time of the victim's death? Is it the shaky man over there who's really questionable? Is it the wine? Soseki-san, if that wine says, Hey, from Soseki-san, <laughs> you're having an issue. <laughs> well, I'm not sure like, where the seduction is going now. I'm afraid it's too late to go back to the house on days of eating too much soap. But the identity of the guest who was here last night when the victim passed away is... is something I have a very bad feeling about. Well, you can try to ignore your feelings, but we cannot ignore the truth, Mr. Narahono. No, I suppose not. Time to look around again. Um... It's empty. Well, empty of liquid, but full of air. That makes you think, doesn't it? It makes me think that you're full of hot air. We should, th we should be thinking about who else is in the room at the time. Oh, bother. Okay, so it wasn't. <laughs> what about these brightly colored books? Or maybe it was those glasses. At first glance, it seems the only things in this room are the makeshift stage and the costumes. I never looked these three books initially. I wonder if they are. Let's see the title, Strad. The picture of Monsole Glicco? Canterbury Yearnings and a meal for Gobara. Oh wait, I'm sure I've heard those tales before. It could just be an incredible coincidence, but they're the exact same three books that Mr. Natsume purchased the other day. Oh, well darn. Huh? Yeah, on the day of the unfortunate incident when Miss Green was stabbed. So Seki-san had just been at the bookshop and bought them, that's right. And now those three titles are here in the room of the victim. Yet Mr. Natsume claims he'd never been here before. Mm, what does this mean, do you think? I really don't know what to make of it. Pile of familiar books. Yeah, we're presenting that. Take that! <laughs> Indeed. What reveals the answer, of course, is the pile of familiar books. Quite so. It's no mere coincidence that these three titles are here in this room. It's the link to the truth. <laughs> Mr. Natsume, you purchased these books four days ago at the second-hand bookshop. Uh, that's just a co coincidence? In that case, you'll be able to bring the same three titles from your own room, will you not? This very moment. <laughs> no, never! Non-negotiable! Well, if you can't bring your own copies here, it proves that these three books are in fact yours. Uh... Having purchased the books four days ago, I returned to your lodgings you were arrested the very next day. So you could conceivably have brought the books here on that evening, but you never mentioned that. In other words, you could have only brought these three books here to the victim's room. <laughs> oh, I really like that. <laughs> Last night, having returned to your lodgings, after the trial concluded at the Old Bailey. I am a In short, there is only one possible conclusion. The victim died here in this room last night as a result of poisoning. And that same night, the victim had a visitor. And that visitor... ...was you, Mr. Suzeki Natsume. RIP. <laughs> Thus concludes the final act of Herlock Shulton's Great Deduction. Seki-san. <laughs> Solved. Deduction complete. Very well done, I might say. Ugh. All right, but we'll find out what Sasaki did really happened. Maybe. I don't know. Next time. <laughs> All right. Laters.